Greetings from the Petersburg Church of Christ. We thank you for allowing us into your home today, and we encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with the message that's presented today. We would also encourage you to take notes and send us any questions or comments that you have concerning today's message to the address that will be provided at the end of the lesson. We invite you to join us any opportunity that you have. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are located at 205 Russell Street, just off the south side of the Petersburg Square. And the Bible has a way of revealing things that we didn't know. We've been discussing the woman's place. We started last Sunday evening. And a lot of people have put the woman back on the farm raising children and doing household duties and thinking that that is all that's involved with the woman's place. Yet if you look at Proverbs chapter 31, beginning there at verse 1, let it speak to your heart a minute. Proverbs 31, beginning at verse 1. Listen to what the wisdom <clears throat> literature of the Old Testament said about some things that women were doing. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction, Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. Usually we don't read that paragraph, but it, I thought there were some things in it that I never had even thought about before, about what was involved in the wisdom of Solomon going forth to this king. The beginning of verse 10, if you think that the woman is in a position of simply doing nothing, just laying around the house. Grasp what's said here. Who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. 
She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Now you can't sit down in that passage and begin calling specific verses and not understand that this is a woman who is busy. She works on up into the night hours. She rises early. She buys a piece of ground and she puts crops out. You think about this. She makes her own material that she makes her clothes out of. What do you think verses 9 and 10 was talking about when it said uh, she, her candle goeth out, out by night, by night, she layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. That is your weaving machinery of that day and time that she was busy making cloth and helping the poor and giving to the needy. The issue is not whether a woman can work and be busy. The issue is not whether she can pray or whether she can teach because definitely she can. We started into that last uh, Sunday evening. It's quite clear that she was actively involved, uh, Priscilla was, with her husband Aquila when they were taking Apollos aside and teaching him the way of the Lord more perfectly. She was helped teaching that man. Now let me hit this angle a minute. There's only two kinds of prayer. Think about it a minute. There's only two kinds of prayer. Private closet prayer. And public, where you're out with people praying. Can a woman engage in private closet, closet prayer? I hope they are right now in the privacy of their own heart. And I hope men folks in this building are doing the same thing. It is not wrong for a woman to engage in private closet prayer. She can do that any time of the day or night. And don't get confused here. Jesus is not saying that you've got to go into a closed closet and shut the door in order to engage in private closet prayer. It's not the room. It's the fact that you are in and of and by yourself talking to God in the depths of your heart and if you want to talk about powerful prayer there's where the power is and women can engage in it, men can engage in it, elders can engage in it, preachers can engage in it, deacons can engage in it, anybody can engage in private closet prayer and need to do so. A woman can pray in the public worship of the church if she does it in the closet private matter. 
because it's quite clear. There are two areas in which the woman is to be in submission and under the authority of someone else. And there's no exception to the rule. She is to be under the authority of her husband in the home. He's the head of the wife. She is to be in submission to him. So let's not confuse the issue. A woman should pray. How in the world can a woman or a man, either one, get to heaven without praying? Because it's something we each need to do. Where the problem comes is she is under the authority of the man in the home and in church. We didn't go into detail in 1 Timothy 2, but it's quite evident that in that text of Scripture, the Bible is very specific about who it is that is to pray in the public worship of the church. Look at it a minute. 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. The, the subject of supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks uh, starts out in the very first verse of, the, of chapter 2. But down to verse 8. Specifically, listen to what it said. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. What does that mean? Exactly what it says. Who is it that is to be praying everywhere in any and every given circumstance in the public worship of the church? Men are to do the praying everywhere. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, those words are not hard. They're sincere, they're straight from the Holy Spirit through Paul to Timothy. And if you lay down 1 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through verse uh, 15, and lay it down beside of 1 Corinthians 14 where we were last Sunday evening, they're so similar. They say the same things. But some have tried to throw these passages out and say they don't apply to us today. Such phrases as, uh, the miraculous uh, tongue-speaking era, era was going on when these passages were written. Well, can you take that reasoning and get rid of the fact that the Bible says that the woman is to be silent in church? I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over who? Over the man. And when a woman gets in front of a congregation of people and she teaches, leads prayer, leads singing, she is in a position where she is usurping authority over the Christian men that are present. And the Bible forbids it. I didn't forbid it. I'm just a human being like you are. But the Bible's very clear. 
that it says that a woman is not to teach nor usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. We live in a time I was actively preaching full time whenever the ERA amendments, the Equal Rights Amendment was being solicited and broadcast all over the country and I preached on this subject, the Woman's Lib movement, many years ago. I don't feel any different. I use the same scriptures today I used then to show the uh, audacity of a society that is trying to put the woman in a position that God never did put her in. But I promise you we was going to deal with the John 3.16 of the feminine gender movement of our day and time. And I'm not talking about John 3.16 as far as when Jesus was speaking in the third chapter of John. And he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm not talking about John 3.16. I'm talking about the main big verse that the women libbers have used and it's worked its way into the church all over the place. Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 29 the context of this passage is the fulfillment of the prophecy to Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And at verse 26 of Galatians chapter 3, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3 verse 27 has been preached for generations, telling how people can get into Christ. They're baptized into Christ, and thus they put on Christ. Well, the movement came along that was trying to justify the woman being able to do anything in the church that a man can do. So they came up with a verse that sounded like it hit the nail on the head. So they started quoting Galatians 3 verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, but you're all one in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Well, whenever a Jew or a Greek would obey the gospel, would be baptized in Christ, they could put on Christ. Whenever uh, bondmen or free men, those under slavery, if you were a, a slave, uh, and you could be in Christ. Uh, if you were a free man, you could obey the gospel and you could come into Christ. If you were a male, you could be baptized in Christ and put on Christ. If you were female, you could be baptized into Christ and put on Christ and the issue here is not the gender of the human personality. The relationship is not between men and women, it's, that's not the, not the context of what the verse is saying. The relationship is between people and serving God. Jews can become Christians and obey the gospel and serve the Lord 
Gentiles or Greeks can do the same thing. Those who are slaves, the bond people, can do the same. Those free. Male and female can do the same. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Does this statement here say that obedience to the gospel changes a Jew to a Gentile? Nothing at all suggested that. If you read your Bible a little bit, you'll find that Apostle Paul, uh, after he obeyed the gospel, he's still a Jew. It didn't change that for him. It didn't change the fact that uh, Cornelius was a Gentile. Where did we get the idea that doing what the Lord said do, to come into Christ and put on Christ, changes your relationship as far as the world is concerned? A close relative years ago quoted this verse to me because they had begun to use women in the services of the church. I know a whole lot more than I'm saying. I could be point blank specific and call names and places. It's not a preacher's story I read somewhere else. I know this to be fact. Hit me right between the eyes. And this close loved one that I'd known all my life quoted Galatians 3 verse 28 suggesting that women could do anything in the church that a man could do. I wasn't mean to him, but I said it point blank. I said it before I even, even thought too good what I said. But he suggested that Galatians 3 verse 28 justified women leading singing, leading prayer, uh, presiding at the Lord's table, they were building a brand new church building about a mile from where I was born and raised. And I said to my close relative, I said, well, why don't you just put one restroom in the church building there? Does baptism into Christ change a man from being a man? Does it change a woman from being a woman? Uh uh, no. Doesn't change it at all. They're still just as much a man or a woman after they have obeyed the gospel as it was before they obeyed the gospel. It doesn't change the female male relationship one iota. One man I was reading after the other day made an interesting observation. You talk about current, right down the line, we're having to deal with it in our society today. He said if Galatians 3 verse 28 changes the male-female position, then what's wrong with same-sex marriage? What's wrong with it? It's not just fine. There is no such thing as changing the gender of a man or a woman. Oh, you can perform complicated surgery and change people. I've heard of that through the years. I don't know of anybody that ever did that. But don't come up with this idea that Galatians 3 verse 28 is the golden text of the feminine gender movement that they can do anything in the church a woman can do anything in the church that a man can do but don't you think they're not using this and throwing their weight around uh, there are women who get on the bandwagon in large congregations across the brotherhood who are forcing the issue that women have the right to be elders in the church well, I got a little problem with that. You know, one of the qualifications for an elder in the church that he be the husband. Of How's a woman going to be the husband of one wife? 
impossible. It's foolishness. It's confusion that the devil is causing to set the cause of Christ back on its heels and stop its advancement in the salvation of men's souls. That's what it's all about. And I'm afraid that's the way it is. Um, there's a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts that you go through in order to try to uh, deal with this sort of thing. The worship of the church is very important. It needs to be done exactly like God said it to be done. We do not need confusion in the assembly of the church and it would cause confusion if women began to take play, take part. Uh, Robert Milligan, I don't know if you've ever done any reading after him, he wrote the commentary on Hebrews in the Gospel Advocate series. He was the founder of Milligan College between Johnson City and Elizabethan and I preached in that area for a number of years and I was aware of what Robert Milligan, he did not believe what the conservative Christian church believed. He didn't preach like they preached. We had Milligan students in the audience where I was preaching and I would quote verbatim from his book, Scheme of Redemption. And they would, they were surprised that Robert Milligan said what he did. Well, Robert Milligan was not going along with the liberal interpretation of the scriptures. He believed what the Bible taught. Well, let me give you a paragraph that I've got for Robert Milligan. And what he's talking about, the assembly of the church. I'm not going to add a word, take a word out. Listen to what he said. Even in the religious assembly, the attention is often arrested and the heart is made to wonder by some improper display of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. But from the closet, all such evil influences are excluded. Here there is no motive to deceive or to make a vain display of our persons, our dress, and our good works. There the mind turns in upon itself. There the conscience is awakened. There we see ourselves in the light of heaven. And there under the deep and solemn conviction that we are on holy ground and the eye of God is upon us, we are almost compelled to be humble, to repent of our sins, to forgive our enemies, to sympathize with the afflicted, to adore our Creator, love our Redeemer, and exercise all the powers of our souls in harmony with the will of God. And if you recall what I said about closet prayer a while ago, Robert Milligan is simply saying that the most powerful prayer that you can engage in is the prayer that you pray to God in and of and by yourself. Whether it's in the assembly of the church or whether it's out somewhere, some other place. And I'd like to add a little bit to what he said here. Pray out loud when you're by yourself. Pray out loud. Let the tone of your own voice hit through your own eardrums and nobody but you and God are realizing what you are praying about. And you might find that powerful closet prayer will make all the difference in the world in your attitude about living. Women need powerful closet prayer. Men need powerful closet prayer. We need to be a praying people 
And we don't need to be confused about the woman's place in the church. We know it's right for her not to participate in public prayer. Vocal leading of the men's minds. That didn't fit. There's a whole lot that needs to be said. One paragraph I used last Sunday night that I want to be sure goes out on the internet was a meeting in Nashville just a few months ago. Some men that I've known for many, many years. One held a gospel meeting here at Petersburg years ago. I was here when he held the meeting. And the question was asked, what would Jesus do? And what he was having reference to was the woman's place in church. What would Jesus do? And this gospel preacher replied, I quote, I suspect that he would do what he did. Choose 12 men to be apostles, later adding Paul, Send the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. Inspire them to write the epistles we have in the New Testament, including the instructions concerning women's role in church as set forth in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. He also observed that if Jesus had really wanted to make a statement about a change in the order concerning the role of women, why did he not choose six women and six men to be apostles? Or better still, why did he not choose 12 women? Good question. Indeed, what Jesus did is the only reliable indicator of what he would do today. And that's some wisdom to that. Why did Jesus not push the woman out front. He didn't. He didn't refuse to have any relationship with, with the women who were on the earth at the time. We are living in a time when the Equal Rights Amendment and the Women's Live Movement is trying to be justified and pushed down the throats of honest, sincere Christians and it's tearing church all to pieces. And naturally it would. Because it's not of God. The author of confusion is not God. It's the devil. And he's doing everything in his power to stop what we're trying to do. Kill it dead. And I'm not going to be quiet. I'm not going to let it go back. I believe we need to be very aware of the fact that there are real issues that are hurting people and setting the cause of Christ back and we need to understand it and throw it to the side and keep on going with what we're trying to do is right. If you're listening to this program and uh, you are thinking about what we're saying, get in touch with us. We'd glad to talk to you. Uh, email us at the website of the church. Uh, also on the telephone. Be glad to talk to you. So we sincerely believe what the Bible teaches, and we're trying our best to offset the problems that a culture today that doesn't understand what the Bible teaches, and they jump into all kinds of conclusions. I thank you very much for listening. If you're in this assembly and we can help you in any way, you need prayers of the church, you need to obey the gospel. If you're listening in and would have questions about this, get in touch with us. Would you come to Jesus while we're standing together? If you have sing? questions or comments concerning today's lesson, you may send those to Petersburg Church of Christ, 205 Russell Street, Petersburg, Tennessee, 37144. Or you may email us at Petersburg Church of Christ at hotmail.com. 
You may also request a copy of today's lesson through the same method. Be sure to include today's date along with the station on which this program aired and the title of the lesson. We hope to see you again next week right here on this station at the same time.